Let's start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the mother of all panels, I would like to believe. We have an almost uh, full house, even if it's early in the morning. And uh, uh, I feel honored to moderate this panel of distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, they are one better than the other. So we hope to demystify this uh, complexities associated with one of the most important sort measures promulgated by International Maritime Organization that has to do with uh, the carbon intensity indicator, CII, and the SEMP part three. Uh, let me introduce you the members of the panel uh, in the in the, the way they are seated. Uh, we have uh, my friend and classmate from Michigan, Panos Zachariadis, who is the technical director of Atlantic Bulk Carriers. He's also vice chairman of BIMCO in uh, Marine Environmental Committee. And uh, very importantly, he was in the drafting committee that drafted the BIMCO clause, CII clause. Then we have uh, so do, please do not throw stones at him if you have different uh, opinion. Uh, Mr. Andreas Hadzipertu, Managing Director of Columbia Ship Management. Mr. Philippos Phillis, uh, President of the European Community Ship Owners Association, who is the Chairman and CEO of Le Michelin Navigation in Cyprus. Then, we have uh, Mr. Kenneth Asland, Environmental Services Lead and Managing Director of Maritime Carbon Solutions for IFHOR and Galbraith. Those two companies have, been, uh, uh, have become one. Then uh, we have uh, Dr. Harry Conway, who is the Chairman of Marine Environmental Protection Committee at IMO, I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate Dr. Conway for being elected as the chairman of MEPC. Uh, I was following this uh, procedure, so congratulations and good luck to your difficult uh, uh, mission. And last by, but not least, we have Mr. Andrea Olivi, who is the head of Wet Fright, wet, wet fright uh, in uh, Trafigura. Allow me a very short introduction of what is CII that we are all following. Very short. CII is what damage we do in the society, which is uh, projected as how much carbon dioxide we emit, divided by the benefit we give to the society which is the capacity of the vessel, the dead weight, times the miles that the vessel will make. So let's start with the first question. Uh, I will go on the reverse order. Let me ask uh, Mr. Olivi. Uh, a ship, the way that CII is uh, defined, a ship has a better CII rating by doing a laden ballast voyage. It favors the ballast voyages because the, the emissions are lower in ballast. We need lower fuel. So this is not uh, uh, so realistic versus a laden, laden trip. Is there a way, Mr. Olivi, to reward the higher utilization of a ship how could have been, what would have been a better KPI? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think this is really our main issue with the current uh, format of CII. We are really potentially promoting bad behavior. Uh, I was talking to a ship owner uh, the other day and he told me, well, yes, of course, we can always ballast to reduce our CII score from E to C. But this is very wrong, in our opinion, 
if, if we promote ballast, we're actually increasing um, emissions overall, both um, on an absolute, but also on an intensity basis. So we think we need to change uh, the current format. Luckily, we do have a better, let's say, KPI or a better formula. That's the EEOI, the Energy Efficiency Operating Indicator. We like it a lot because it focuses on ton mile work and not on dead weight. And we think by just tweaking the CII and moving away from AER towards EEOI, we can already improve um, this metric. I know EEOI by itself, it's not perfect, but it's definitely uh, better than uh, AER. Um, another important thing that I would like to stress is CII should not be seen as the holy grail that will allow us to decarbonize shipping. It's one of the tools available to both charters and owners to start thinking about decarbonization and improve behavior in their uh, chartering activities. Uh, one more thing, and then I, I stop. I know we don't have much time. We've been working with EEOI for almost two years now through Sea Cargo Charterer. Sea Cargo Charterer is an association of owners and charters which are getting together to align, let's say, their climate intentions to chartering activities. Um, we are finding uh, signatories. I, I really recommend to all the owners and charters here to look up uh, into Sea Cargo Charter and join because it's, a, it's really a fantastic uh, association. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to elaborate a little bit why EOI was not chosen. Uh, EOI utilizes the more realistic cargo carried, not the dead weight. Evidently, it takes care of utilization inherently. The reason it was not chosen is because the data collection system of IMO did not consider the, uh, the cargo carried as it was considered in the MRV data collection of European community. Uh, so this was one of the reasons. And the other, can you put the slide, please? Here you see uh, how the EOI changes uh, for 11 sister tankers over a period of five years. You can see it is all over the map. It is not a very robust index. It goes up and down. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, comes from a submission to IMO uh, a few years ago at an MEPC. Uh, and further, there is, this is taken from a paper uh, of Danish Technical University, which shows the variation of both EOI and, and, uh, and uh, a, a annual emission ratio, which is the basis of CII. You can see that both are not very good, but uh, the annual emission ratio is, is way better. Uh, it's probably the best we have. So on a relative scale, it is useful to help us uh, uh, get useful conclusions for the efficiency of a vessel. But you can see that it's practically both of them are essentially varying a lot. And time will show how usable will be to assess the energy efficiency of a vessel. I think we may, we may need another panel to counter that, but I, 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 will not, I will not add anything at this stage. Yes, yes. it is not an easy uh, decision. Uh, I was uh, present uh, in, the, in the session working group when this was discussed, the supply or the demand based. Uh, it was not an easy decision. And the audience and the, the countries at IMO were split in the decision. And Zweinung Goffendal did an excellent job to reconcile. Uh, I would like to ask uh, 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 
like uh, uh, Mr. Zachariadis, uh, would a lower uh, CII rating make the vessel less attractive to charterers or buyers? And would CII incentivize owners to lower ship speed and thereby lower fuel consumption to improve the CII rating? CII is the basis that we categorize the vessels from inferior to superior, and it is thus important. Yeah, thank you and good morning to everybody. It's so nice to see a full room early in the morning. Uh, before I answer your question, John, I cannot but uh, make a comment about the debate EOI or AR. I call EOI a random number generator. That's, that's how I call it. It's the, the uh, studies that have been submitted to IMO show that it is three times as random as AR which means if you are working with AR, you have a, a good chance to achieve the rating you want using your own actions, such as reducing the speed of your ship. But EOI is so random that um, you cannot actually um, achieve a rating based on EOI, based on your own actions. Its chance plays a much bigger role than AR. So, so I think the calls to apply EOI to CII, um, I, I don't agree with them. And if that happens, I think we're going to regret it in the future. But let's, let's move on. This is opinions. I base my opinion based on the, on the studies that I have seen, like the one you showed uh, from DTU. Now, uh, would charters prefer uh, better rated ships? Uh, obviously, of course they would. I, I, I would also like, however, for them to prefer to take on their own responsibilities in order to achieve this rating. Because, like you said, I was part of this uh, drafting group who have been working on that clause for eight months. We left no stone unturned. It's a very fair clause. It's a good clause. And the fact that several charters don't like it uh, uh, tells me that, that perhaps uh, their money is not where their mouth is. Um, so if the charters would actually take on their responsibilities, then it would be fair for them to demand better rated ships. But if they consider, that, oh, this is none of my business, and then they request good ships, um, how are they going to find them? Um, now, whether, whether a good CII means an efficient ship, I disagree with that too. Um, what CII shows is not if the ship is efficient or not, is what to, if the operation of the ship that has happened up to that point um, was suitable for the, for the index that we're using. That's all. Um, yes, so th this was the idea. Uh, the short-term measures of IMO, uh, are, we have technical measures promulgated by EXI, and we also have operational uh, indices, which is the CII. But uh, in continuation of this uh, question about speed reduction, I would like to go to, to Mr. Phyllis, and uh, Mr. Phyllis runs a medium to small size shipping company, very well organized, uh, he has vessels that are inherently energy efficient, equipped with energy saving devices, coated with low friction anti-fouling, operated with high uh, utilization rate, applying voyage optimization and weather routing. And I have a question, what will happen in the event that uh, one of them is rated D or E? What can be done other than speed reduction to improve its rating or avoid uh, commercial repercussions from charterers? Uh, thank you, John. Um, allow me to uh, speak and also not as president of Exxon because I have to express my own opinion and my own experience. Uh, before, before I answer your question, um, I, I have to 
uh, give my opinion regarding the EOI and, and uh, AER. Um, we, we have been monitoring internally through the systems. We have uh, a fleet of very, relatively very efficient vessels, phase two and phase three from uh, the built-in phase. And uh, we, our rating of uh, the best AER vessel rated A receives the worst uh, EOI score. And this is because EOI relates with the transport work and the emission per ton transported. AER has nothing to do with that. And I think this penalizes the, high, the highly efficient uh, vessels. And I, I didn't agree with Andrea that EOI is a better measurement and is more fair to the efficient, uh, efficient vessels. Um, going, going now to your question, uh, in, indeed, uh, we face uh, the situation where uh, system vessels, which are really very efficient, are rated from category A to category D. And uh, if, I, if, I, if we will be in the position to uh, rectify those being in category D for uh, three consecutive years, uh, we have not many things to do because the ships are equipped with all the energy uh, saving devices that you can think. Uh, they have uh, very high uh, uh, quality of uh, anti-fouling, uh, very high efficient propeller, and we keep maintaining the, the hull in very well condition, and still the rating is D because exactly of the operation pattern. Uh, the only thing we can do uh, is only change the fuel and move towards a percentage of uh, biofuel. Uh, bio, uh, biofuel. Uh, there are no many other things to do. Um, going, on, going one step forward, uh, based on the BIMCO clause, which maybe we we'll talk later, uh, this vessel most likely uh, will uh, be discounted when we change charter and we record it uh, for consecutive years uh, category D, well, despite the fact that this is one of the most uh, uh, most efficient ship uh, available in the market at this moment. Thank you. I would like to come to Dr. Conway and ask a question that many of you in the audience will wonder. Uh, I, IMO has not added teeth to the enforcement of the CII-based rating. Are there, if you can say, any plans to do that in the future following the revision of CII in 1st of January of 2026? And how motivated some ship owners will be to comply today in 2023? What if charterers don't care if the vessels they lease have a D or an E rating? Dr. Conway. Please. Thank you. Um, it's good listening to the debate. Um, the interesting issue is that um, what this debate does, it brings out the, uh, either the limitations or the strength of whatever regulation that is adopted at the IMO. Um, with that said, um, as you may be aware, you know the CRR has just entered into force, which is, uh, came into force on the 1st of November 2022. So we are yet to gather a practical data from the implementation of the mechanism. So that will be done from the data we are going to gather this year. In IMO, we say uh, we rely on experience gain, policy, and practice are two different things. Very seldom you see policy aligned with practice. So you in the industry, um, you are the one that are going to provide us the data upon which we are going to rely to carry on any revision. Definitely, um, we are listening to the concerns that are being raised. For example, the issue of uh, vessels, why the vessel is idling away, or the wait time it put, it is, uh, it sends the chance of having a very low rating, either a G or an E, because of the 
carbon emission from the generators that are being run to, to warm up the vessel, to keep the vessel while it's waiting in port. Another concerns we have heard about the issue of short voyages versus long voyages. So these are all factors um, on one hand that either the ship owners or the chapters have no control over. Uh, all I can say, we from the IMO, we are, we are currently receiving proposals um, to see how to address these concerns that are being uh, raised. So my advice to industry players, to you, is that um, you are to provide us the practical data. You are the ones that are going to inform the proposals that come before us is based on the data that we make our decisions or the regulations. As we say at the IMO, we, we, we make fact-based regulations. We cannot make regulations based on our conjectures or speculations or estimates. The, re the regulation is based on facts. So if you give us these things, we will. Yes, 2026 is the period over which we will conduct the revision. But that does not mean that uh, the revision cannot start now if we start seeing uh, data that is pointing to the contrary. The ultimate goal is to see how international shipping can ensure that we achieve the 1.5 degree C as per the Paris Agreement. And the only way we can, the only way we can do that is if we play our part as people in the shipping industry. And to, for us to play our part, you in the industry, those that are operating the uh, vessels in, in the real world, and those that are experiencing the challenges and difficulties with the regulations we bring about, you are the one that are come, going to come to us and say, uh, I am, this regulation has X, Y, Z limitation. And we think the way to address these limitations is to go in this direction. We as a party, 75 member countries, we will debate these regulations and then we will revise it and come up with something that will ensure that shipping is making its fair contribution to the reduction of CO2 globally. As I can tell you from what I said, and as you may be aware, we are under considerable pressure at the IMO to play our part. We have no excuse. There is no way to excuse it. We all know the climate challenge is real. We saw the situation that happened in Pakistan recently, the flooding. We see how California has been burning, Europe has mm -hmm. been burning, Nigeria, and what have you. So, I mean, people are not going to accept, uh, oh, yes, there is this problem, there is a limitation. Or I would say, as you identify the problems, also make sure you identify alternative solutions that will ensure we rain in CO2. Anything to the contrary, it will be difficult to um, have the IMO or the member states that IMO changing their mind. Thank you very much. I, I would like to point out that uh, we are honored with the presence of the IMO secretary, Mr. Kitak Lim. He is uh, present and uh, we welcome him. They are doing a wonderful job and uh, they have a very difficult task as uh, uh, Dr. Conway mentioned and uh, they are the basic, the basic contributor in the, this pathway to decarbonization, and we are certain that they will succeed. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Asland, how does CAI fit within the market of the ships that it serves, uh, the commercial implications of CAI, and the impact on the ship owners and charterers? It's not very easy for uh, legislators to put out new legislations. There will always be a winner and there will always be a loser, even if a legislator tries to present something neutral. From my point of view, looking from the market side, what I find the most critical thing is that I don't see that CII caters for the market that the ships are serving, the commodity market. We know that currently the commodity market is colored by geopolitical events, uh, market fundamentals, and pricing options. The drivers behind trading 
is the ability to take advantage of optionality. Optionality is delivered very much through shipping. <clears throat> These kind of optionalities could be in terms of pricing options, having month-end options uh, on, on the crude side, where you have the ability to either buy or sell the crude on the average of one month minus one or the other months plus one. For that reason, you want the vessel to arrive, say, 10 nautical miles outside uh, the area where you tend the notice, and you let the owner tend the notice to the trader and not to the port authorities. The vessel can only tend the notice at the time when the trader has decided to go for M plus one or M minus one. So basically, you're already talking, you know, three to five days the marriage on load port. And the same could be repeated at discharge port. Another thing is that the commodity that is transported is either in contango or in backwardation. Contango and backwardation is the main driver in terms of which route a vessel is taken, if it's going through the uh, the Suez Canal, or if it's going through or passing the Horn on its way to Asia. Another thing is how the, the chain of command or how the supply chain really works. Say, for example, in the crude market, it's very unusual that <clears throat> the owners know exactly where they're going. They know the load port but they have given a wide range of discharge options, which has a very wide geographical location. For example, US Gulf, USAC, and Caribs. With that option to be declared, either at loading or just before loading, and sometimes also after loading. Say, for example, if you load Bonnie Light from Nigeria, it's very normal to have all the mentioned US Gulf, USAC, Caribs, etc., and also Europe on the uh, Suez Max. And the driver behind that is, of course, arbitration. Where is the best location to take it? If you go to Asia, you will have a Singapore for order. If you are in steep contango, we know that the cheapest form of um, storing. So driving this contango, contango meaning that what you have today will have a bigger value tomorrow. So you want to drive this by making money, just storing this. The cheapest form of storage is at sea. So the trader will aim in the start to go for a low demerge, even if the demerge should maybe account for what the current TCE or the market is currently. And it will put the vessel on the marriage until you hit the tension. It will, could maybe then uh, end up as a storage vessel with a storage option. Imagine all of these mentioned things, what kind of implications that will have on the CII score. And lastly, in terms of what you mentioned, that sometimes it makes sense to put an ID out and then let the players in the market help you to drive the outcome of such a legislation. I think in this case, it's very dangerous because I think that, as we will see, this will have severe financial consequences. I believe that there's high chance that oil majors will say that we will only work with vessels above the rating D. So as a kind of like a test experiment for IMO, it has enormous consequences for the owners, and I find all the mentioned a bit unfair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me come to Mr. Hadzipetro. Uh, Columbia manages about uh, uh, 500 ships. Uh, how these uh, clients uh, deal, how they tackle the complexities and the challenges associated 
with the CII regulation, uh, Andreas. Thank you, John. Let me just generally mention that obviously here we are all trying to meet the IMO target of 2030 and 2050. And what has substantially changed now is the mindset of the ship owners, whereby generally they are looking for means to be to have more efficient ships, to be to renew their fleets as far as possible and to to appear as more um, sensitive to green initiatives and so on. Within the environment of uh, CIA and the complexities, the way we see it is that uh, basically all the clients are well aware of the rating of their own of their own ships and they have been advised what measures can be taken in order to improve the rating. The way they approach the, or the way we see that the clients approach the subject is that depending on the risk appetite of the client, depending on the profile of each company, they select different methods of, of dealing with it. For example, on the container side, we have seen uh, clients with fleets of ships talking already to their long-serving uh, charterers and they jointly discuss the fleet utilization, they jointly discuss measures to be taken, and they take an approach whereby, as partners, they are tackling the, the issues uh, jointly. There has been a discussion, obviously, on, on the charter rates and the, and the BIMCO clause, but in general, for, let's say, the container shipping, we see more approach towards already started working together between charterers and, uh, and owners. For sh ships trading spot is slightly different, whereby the, the owners are, they take a more specific approach, what can I do for my ship for the next month or the next uh, year and so on. And uh, we see an appetite to invest in order to improve, but everybody knows that the main advantage will come through the fleet utilization that they have for their, for their vessels. Um, so it's a mixture. It depends on uh, the age of the ship, on the rating, on the chartering, and, and the type. So there's no, it, it's very individual, so it's not one rule uh, fits all. Thank you. And we come, you mentioned the BIMCO clause. I think it's about time to discuss it. Please be brief as much as you can because uh, the, of the, in the essence of, uh, in the interest of time. Uh, I would like to start with Mr. Olivier. BIMCO tried to balance the rights of ship owners to have a good CII rating with the uh, obligation of the charterers uh, to satisfy their uh, third party contracts. Do you think that the BIMCO clause is appropriate? Is it good balance? Can the owners uh, include this type of clause in their contracts? What do you say? I don't Olivier? think uh, the words balance and being co close should be used uh, in the same sentence. <laughs> Sorry to say. It's extremely against the charter's favor, I would say. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, Trafigura today is not only a cargo provider, but we are also a shipping operator. So we are wearing both hats. And what I can share with you is when we are providing vessels on time charter to some of our clients, we do not ask for the BIMCO clause today because we don't think it's, it's ready. We don't think it's fit for purpose. Uh, when we are charters, we have had several owners pushing for the unamended BIMCO clause, but after negotiations and discussions, we have been able to agree to a softer version that does not push all indemnities and liabilities on charter's account. And, and it's a softer clause which promotes dialogue between charters and owners to ensure that we can try to reduce uh, the vessel's um, emission and, and improve the score. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, what about... Uh uh, Panos, uh, you were in the drafting committee. Do you agree? Uh... Well, of course, of course, I don't agree. And uh, as far as the fairness and the balance, we we just follow 
decades of, of established uh, uh, charter party practice, when you have pro forma charter parties, it's always the entity that gives the order has a higher responsibility than the entity that has to follow the order. And the IMO itself has indicated to whom the regulation applies. It says it is an operational regulation. In a long-term time charter, the operator of the ship is the charterer. So that's a regulation primarily addressed to whoever is the operator of the ship um, for a long-term time charter, that's the charter. So whether we like it or not, that's what it is. But since I have the floor, if I, if I can only very briefly say that if, if it was up to me to improve the CII, first of all, CII is, is a good thing in that it leads to slower speeds. And whatever leads to slower speeds means lower emissions. So it's an incentive. Uh, speed reduction is the main tool um, uh, an operator has to achieve the CII rating that they want. So if I could improve it, what I would do, instead of changing the metric from AER to EOI and all that kind of thing, I would take the unfairness out of CII. And CII uh, has been unfair, for example, to bulk carriers. I remember in 2019, where we were making the baselines for CII in the correspondence groups and the working groups. How many of the people in this room know that the bulk areas already have achieved since 2019 a 40% reduction in their emissions based on 2008? Because that's the target of CII. So in 2019, we we're looking at the data and we said, the bulk has already achieved 40% reduction. Therefore, at least the yearly reduction for CII for bulk areas should not be 2%, it should be 0.5%. And the ships that haven't achieved, have achieved the less, which was the container ships, having achieved only 17% reduction from 2008, they should have 5% reduction every year. And it's easy for container ships to achieve that because they have the capacity to reduce speed easily. They are high-speed ships. Bulk carriers is very difficult. One not reduction in bulk carrier is a disaster. So it's those kinds of inefficiencies that, that should be re-looked at CII if we wanted to improve it, in my opinion. But knowing IMO, I know this would be very difficult to do. The, there was a discussion on IMO, and I believe that bulk carriers, especially bulk carriers, have satisfied, have yeah. satisfied the target of 40% reduction yeah, already. It, it, it was chosen that all the ships will be lumped exactly. together and we came up with a 2% for the whole um, shipping fee. But carriers were okay. Yeah. Uh, the BIMCO clause is not so easy. It, it's complex. So it necessitates the utilization of computers. I would like to ask Mr. Phyllis, uh, who, whose company uh, has generated a subsidiary within the company and utilizes artificial intelligence and predictions, projections of CII. Do you think that CII is a game changer in the pathway to the digitalization, which is a sine qua non for decarbonization? Uh, thank you, John, for the question. Uh, allow me, before I uh, answer your question, to uh, speak a little bit about the, uh, the, the PIMCO clause. I think, uh, for me, it's a paradox that there is a legislation uh, that affects the owner and cannot get uh, the uh, responsibilities or cannot transfer the responsibilities to the operator as well. I remember 2020, we had the lawsuit for legislation, and everybody has complied, no dispute. So the charter didn't have the chance to say, no, I don't uh, fuel the vessel with lawsuit for. Why now not? And uh, in fact, the owner has its obligations, uh, like uh, maintaining the vessel, uh, reducing uh, as much as possible off hires, do the, uh, the hull cleaning regularly, or monitor the hull cleaning, do the problem polishing, and uh, uh, the trim optimization, et cetera, et cetera. And the charter should care about the speed, 
about the operation profile in order uh, to uh, reduce uh, the carbon emission by staying shorter at port and uh, doing even less ballast, despite the fact that uh, the CII doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't work with this. And the responsibilities are not taken on. All the soft clauses, all the, uh, the new uh, clauses that have been uh, submitted by the, uh, the chapters are very vague. So th they take no responsibility at all. And I think this as long as uh, we cannot uh, tolerate, we have to push forward. Maybe we need to work a little bit on uh, uh, managing uh, a little bit the, uh, the clause, uh, but the clause has, uh, has, has to prevail. Uh, otherwise, the market will have uh, uh, hundreds of different clauses in our charter parties. Uh, this is my opinion. Uh, one, uh, one very important thing which is relate, uh, relates with uh, or to, to your question is uh, where are owners, charters, and ports have uh, common responsibilities? I think uh, owners and charters they have common responsibilities as far as the fuels and maybe the possibility to use some fuels where they have uh, less carbon uh, emission uh, factor. And uh, another thing is the CII monitoring, uh, where both uh, they need to monitor this, uh, the CII in development, and uh, of course uh, where the terminals are coming into the picture is in order to uh, achieve them just in time so the ships uh, we say less speed and arrive at the ports uh, just in time and do, do not spend time on Anchorage waiting uh, for, uh, for the charging or for the operation. Uh, these are the common, uh, uh, common areas where uh, collaboration is needed. Going now to uh, whether digitalization will be a game changer or not, met. in fact, will be a game changer. Uh, the ships uh, should be uh, uh, real-time monitor. We need to use uh, enhanced uh, onboard telemetry uh, where, where the data should be used for route optimization but also for projecting the development of the CII. Internal studies have shown that uh, if we manage by uh, May to form a CII rating this can not be easily changed until the end of the year. So it's something that uh, uh, the, first, the first few months, uh, because of the, uh, the trade of the back carriers, where you have maybe a ballast and then a loaded and waiting, uh, there is a variation of the CII rating. Going forward uh, with the new trips after the first uh, uh, 80 to 90 days, then uh, the formation of the CII is done. And by end of May, if you have a rating, the percentages uh, of uh, changing towards the end of the year are, are about 10%. Uh, so it's very important that we, we have the tools on board to monitor the CII is going forward and in collaboration with the charters to agree uh, the further operation profile. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have about 44 seconds uh, Kenneth, can you say something in 44 seconds? <clears throat> yes, I'll focus on the main thing. <clears throat> I think it's very important that uh, the cargo owners take their responsibility together with the owners. If I decide to go out and rent uh, a car from Hearst and drive it straight into the wall, who's responsible for that? Is it Hearst or is it me? We need a common platform where these two participants, the main drivers of the market, can look at the information and what um, <clears throat> the different action um, creates in terms of CII. I think that EU ETS is probably a very good option. Uh, I think the best option is just to put an extra tax when on top of the, the, the bunker, when you bunker, as we do today when we drive a car. Uh, that takes care of everything. And I think what we have done over the last 10 years is to put tremendous amount of administrative burden on the ship owners. And in terms of digitalization, I think shipping 
trading commodity markets is probably the last n not digital market or industry that will be digitalized. And I don't think with all the administrative burden that the owners are looking at, I don't think they have a choice. Final words, I think it's very important that the cargo owners and not only the owners carry the responsibility of cutting emissions moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that closing uh, remark uh, by Kenneth, I would like to close the panel and uh, wish uh, good luck to IMO in this coming July, MEPC uh, in July, which is going to be very important, trying to bridge the gap between fossil and low carbon fuels, uh, zero carbon fuels. Very important decisions. Dr. Conway, wish you success and good luck in this coming MEPC. Thank you very much, the panel. It was an excellent panel. I hope that uh, uh, we, I wish we had more time, but uh, thank you.